Good Gab, sponsored by Skillskin, a nonprofit organization empowering individuals with disabilities through employment. Hey, Good Gabbers, Steve here. Hey, thanks for supporting us. We keep growing the show. It's just unbelievable. Uh, and today, I think we have just we have a real special guest for you. This is Lars Gilberts, VP of Equity and Community Development at Numerica Credit Union. Lars, thanks for joining us. Thank you. Well, cool. Yeah, it's, a, it's sunny. I was down in LA this week. Oh, nice. um, yeah, I just got back last night about midnight and... Yeah. It was the first time I've been to LA and it just, it rained. It was cloudy every day. Yeah. I'm like, oh, okay. And everyone said was apologizing when I was down there. I was like, this is strange. (laughs) I'm like, they really were concerned, you know, that, you know, I was from out of town. We were so sorry about this weather. So yeah, it was just an interesting thing, but we were down there for a conference and yeah, it was, uh, it was fun. And now we're back in Spokane and it's yeah. an interesting area. I'll be down there in a couple, about a month and a half myself, actually. Nice. What are you doing down there? Um, I'm actually finishing up a, uh, or taking another step in a degree, uh, which is part of kind of why I even changed careers a little bit, that I wanted to reach more of my potential to help others to reach more of theirs. And so I'm in a kind of a terminal credit union degree um, at uh, Claremont. Um, so, which is Peter Drucker, like that's where he finished his career. So like I'm geeking out about yeah. all this type of stuff. Um, but yeah, it's a two week intensive every summer and uh, kind of, uh, yeah, it's, it's a, it's a terminal degree. If it doesn't kill you, it, it, it's the, hopefully the last one you need. So <laughs> nice. That's awesome. Well, I know Well, tell our listeners a little bit about yourself and you know, yeah, who's Lars Gilbert's, um, great question. So yeah, I think, uh, I'm adaptive. I think that's probably the biggest <laughs> thing. So, uh, when people, you know, like tall people like, oh, how tall are you? Like, it's so like so kind of one of my like calling card things is I've moved 34 times uh, in 14 areas in three countries. I'm a dual citizen. Um, like I grew up. You're everywhere. Uh, right. Well, and, and, and that's still here locally. And, and part of that was um, I grew up kind of in, in between spaces. I was often the other. Um, and so one thing that was important for me uh, even when I didn't feel accepted or feel included or I, like I belonged, uh, something I, I I learned early is I wanted other people to feel that way, even if I didn't feel like I deserved that. And then I worked through some of that stuff, obviously. But uh, subsequently, like here in Spokane, that's something that I, I love. Like what I enjoy getting to be as a leader is I have privilege, I have access. So yeah. how am I using that to help other people feel more welcome uh, and that they have access um, to the things that matter for them? So that's, so I think for me, like in, in all those journeys, um, yeah, I really learned how to adapt. And often I'm in the, in between my, my parents, my mom's like 14 plus generations pacifist. My dad's 14 plus generation military. I'm the first person. That's uh, quite the uh, opposite sides of the spectrum. Canadian American. So it's, uh, if it's in between space of, um, business speak and nonprofit, if it's faith and secular, if it is multiple cultures in, in the kind of the, the, the white, uh, main culture, whatever it is, I've often been in that. And even for 15 years of my life, I lived in the subtropics. Uh, so on the Mexican border in South Florida, where kind of our definitions is like that we were in between spaces. Uh, so we're not Mexico. We're not the U S we're uh-huh. in between or it's, we're not the U S we're not the Caribbean, but we're South Florida. And it's um, where cultures blend. Right. And I think yeah. a lot of here in, in Spokane, it's, I realized like, cause this is home for me. This is where I would spend uh, all, all the time I could coming back here to see my dad's side of the family. Yeah. And they're based here. They're yeah, yeah. They're based here. And my mom's side is on the other side of the border. And I realized like Spokane really is this melting ground. And it, kind of always has been my, my sister's first nation, my aunt's native American. And just when you think of like gathering places we're we're recording this right by the gathering place yeah, the, and an essential one. Right. And this is for, for different tribes for different back, uh, for just even where different terrains come together here. Um, and just part of what drew me back was, was family and the gathering place for family, but also just, I love Spokane's pragmatic progressivism that you're willing to help out your neighbor, but you also believe in accountability. Right. And so like that you need that healthy balance with, within ourselves, within our families, within our communities, if you're really going to reach more as much of your potential as you can. And I'm loving getting to be back and be part of that for the last six years. Well, how did Spokane get you back? So kind of the, I guess first part is how I, I left. Um, the kind of the last time that I left, 
Um, I had finished up an undergrad in marketing and had done a, a kind of a turnaround for a small business and realized, man, I felt called to like tithe of my life. Um, my family had been kind of working class, struggled a lot financially, and I was very committed to not struggle in the same uh-huh. ways. <laughs> like, no, I want to yeah. go make you know, a crap ton of money and then go invest that into doing good in the, in the world, but not have to struggle as much myself. And I felt a real call in my life to tithe of my life. The future's not guaranteed. Right. And so, you know, it's nice that maybe someday I might have energy. I might have money to give back. But if I wait until I have what's left over, I might have more wisdom, but I might not have everything else. And so I felt called to do that. And uh, it's kind of a, a God thing, a job I had never applied for, uh, an area that I'd never gone to for a job that was never posted, someone reached out to me in South Florida to say, hey, are, I love that. are you interested in doing this thing? And it was something that I'd wanted to go to do in Moldova or Uzbekistan with Peace Corps to do. And it was in inner city Miami helping and you people. And do it right here in the States. It was, yeah. and it was, it was a, an amazing opportunity, challenging, um, but it was wonderful. And it was people that had a side hustle that wanted to have a, a business that were need-based entrepreneurs to be able to provide for their family. And how do we help them to be able to grow uh, and stabilize their lives? And that led to um, not just starting with their business, but like, you know, a lot of folks that are starting off a business, their personal finances are commingled, which oh, is yeah. not good to grow it. <laughs> and so helping them to figure out like, how do you stabilize your family? How do you navigate taxes? How do you, all of this stuff. So I ended up developing uh, a, a whole continuum of services, uh, everything from emergency needs all the way up through business services, micro lending, personal financial planning. And that's where I ended up working. Right in the heart of Miami. In the heart of Miami yeah. and with crazy amazing partners. We were doing studies with the Brookings Institute and uh, the CFPB, working with Wells Fargo. And, and Bank of America and credit unions and the United Way said, hey, you're bringing people together that wouldn't normally work together. We're trying something new to talk about those that are working hard but falling short, those that are asset limited, income constrained and employed. Do you want to help change the conversation around this? And so for the last three years, I led some of those changing conversations around policy and investment, business practices, education, philanthropy r- across the state of uh, Florida, across the 67 counties, 420 uh, cities. And bringing people together around Alice, humanizing people that are above poverty, but below what it takes to survive. Uh-huh. And it was amazing. And You're after, like, I'm in. I did that for three years. And what the, the, I've gotten better at being able to lead myself. Because I'm absolutely on that board. That comes with uh, some age, doesn't it? it? Happy to share more about yeah. that, that, some of that journey. But because um, I, I also kind of, I, I went over and lived in Germany uh, on my own when I was 16 um, as kind of an ambassador for the U S as part of a kind of a historic thing. So I feel like I've, I've had some, I've had to early, I've had to learn how to lead myself early and yes, we keep on learning and hopefully until our dying day, how do we lead ourselves better so that we can lead others and organizations and communities. Um, and I realized that if others don't, aren't in alignment with how I believe I need to leave, lead, then I should probably leave. Otherwise I'm going to get frustrated. So I understand that, right? Yeah. But people's uh, values need to start aligning and your, your corporate values, personal values, doesn't all have to be the same, but there's gotta be a significant overlap. Right? Yeah. I know it does for me. And that's the people I want to be around too. Absolutely. Then we can, we move quickly. We build trust quickly. Yes. We can, yeah. You know, impact change quickly. Yeah. Well, and it was yeah. at that inflection point of op- pursuing opportunities there, but differently, or do I find a chance to get closer to family? And at that time I had three grandparents still alive. And so there was an opportunity with the university district. And while that particular type of, had I done some of the specific things that they might've wanted? No, but did I know how to bring people together to achieve something greater than each of us could have done on our own? Absolutely. Tell us more about that. Cause I have a personal belief in, you know, the power of partnership, mm-hmm. uh, but that it's not everyone believes in that, right? No. Like, where did that come from for you? Wow. I, I, well, I'm, cl- I'm collaboratively competitive. Um, Ooh, I love it. All <laughs> right, tell me more. So, like, yeah. losing is not acceptable. Um, but I don't need to... It's not a win-lose scenario in most parts of life. Mm-hmm. And so figuring out, like, how do we achieve some more things together, but also, like, get motivated by trying to compete. And so I think I've seen that in a lot of parts of life where um, how do we find things that aren't zero-sum games to draw people toward. Uh, And so here with the university district, we had like about 25 different um, directors and they're, you know, the presidents of the university CEOs, the mayor, council president, council. uh, So like a lot of competing interests, a lot of competing interests, um, people that were passionate though. Um, And so if you can find a way to uh, help them 
achieve the things that they value in a way that don't feel like there's loss, uh -huh. then it's a, it's a great opportunity to bring people together. And something that leaders like to be led, all of us, I think, like to be led but not have our voice diminished. Yeah. And so that was a big thing to, to learn that um, for those last three years in, in Florida, my bosses, I had 33 CEOs that were my bosses. Um, and, their, wow. and their bosses were boards of CEOs. Uh, and so, in the, and at the time, third largest state, like we had, like it was, um, I had to learn how to uh, work in that power base. So that was great preparation for here. And I just, it kept on learning just no matter how powerful a person is, no matter how much uh, control they have over their domain, they want to have a good leader lead them Yeah, that also values their voice. And so that was something that's that, so human, right? And it yeah. works at every level. So like out in the community, like don't do things to a community, do it with them. Don't do something for them without them. And so if it's a CEO or if it's a mom on her front parts that are trying to, that are trying to care for the, her community, like whatever it is, they want leadership, but they also want their voice to matter. We say that a lot in the disability community mm -hmm. and you know what Skillskin's doing. And there's, it's just a wonderful, you know, phrase is, you know, nothing about us without us. And I'm like, Amen. Oh, it's powerful. Yep. And you know, I don't want to co-opt their term, but I am because <laughs> it's like, it's just so good for anyone. Yeah. And it speaks to exactly what you're talking about. Absolutely. I love that. Yeah. So, okay. Yeah. You're, you're, you're learning how to pull these things together, connecting dots, um, building teams. Yeah. Being in this, you know, I would claim like a servant leader role, right? Mm -hmm. You're serving for the greater good and yep. s service to others. Absolutely. I, yeah. I think how I'm built, I am in, in, I love to follow good leaders and good plans. I am an amazing number two, cause I will be on board and I will keep on challenging, refining, pushing. And in the absence of a leader or a plan, I will lead. And so that's often where I found myself. And I've tried to let myself, like that's not a bad thing. I've, I've, I've had to let myself be that. But for me in that, it's, um, I, I always put myself in a, in a servant leader role. If I have a clear person or plan that I'm supporting or following, or in the absence of that, my job is to clarify that, be that uh, leader for, a, a group or a community, but it's serving a mission and a purpose. And that's Absolutely. honestly what my core um, motivation during the pandemic, I think all of us learned a little bit more about ourselves during the pandemic. And I was reminded of, of critical things that were, that were meaningful for me that weren't being fully lived out in my, my role at the university district. Um, and it really is that servant leadership. Like I, yeah, I'm, did you share an aspect with us? Yeah, absolutely. Like what, what, what came out during that time for you? Yeah. So I, so so much of my life, I've seen my vocation, my occupation. I've been so blessed that those things have often come together. The thing that, that calls me out, the thing that pays my bills and come together and is, is just wonderful. Uh, and I had forgotten, I hadn't realized actually how much motivation drives us on the day to day. And so Enneagram is a, is, as a personality assessment and other things that's been pretty helpful. And it helped me realize like how committed I am to refining things, to reforming, to improving things. And it really reminded me, I am so focused on justice and freedom, freedom especially. And so like there's three different areas in my life that I've cared about freedom, but I've gotten to be in part of it in different ways. One is the personal freedom. One is kind of situational. One is systemic. So much of my life, so I developed the United Way Center for Financial Stability, kind of a national best practice on how do you coach people to financial success, uh, especially in kind of in a working class situation. Um, and in that, so much of our personal beliefs limit us. Oh, yeah. Especially in a first world situation that how many people do we know that we love that they've got a great situation, but they are so their beliefs about what they deserve, um, what their, their story is, whatever limits what they think they can do. And that is just heartbreaking. And we can so often believe for someone else way better than they can believe for themselves. So that idea of self-partnership and being able to navigate ourselves to freedom really matters. And also in the situation, so helping families to be able to find jobs, to be able to manage their finances, yeah, to be able to grow their businesses. Right. So that, that situational freedom, um, removing barriers is important, but also systems that, and this is maybe a, a hot take perhaps, I really resonate with the, the concept of when you look at misogyny or racism or ableism or anything else like that, I really don't give a flying frick about 
if someone actively thinks badly about a person or a group, look at the effect. And so when we look at, for just not the person, but the systems, our systems are designed to get certain results. And when we look at the results, our systems still often are ableist. They are misogynist. They are racist. Not because of bad people or bad intentions, but because the systems are still designed to get that. And so I have, I've actively tried to work from the outside. I know for me, part of this working in the financial system, not just with the financial system is numerica is in, I'm grateful to get to work with numerica. Sure. They're a low income designated. I can, I can go on and on about all the amazing things about them. Look at the board. 44% of our board are women, are BIPOC. You do not see a financial institution that doesn't just talk a good game, but half of our senior leaders are women. This, this is something that matters. Representation matters. And we, they also believe, we also believe that when you know better, you do better. And so we have to keep on True. learning. Okay, well, that's those are that's really uh, big picture thinking, and you know, for setting yourself up personally around this idea of freedom, like how are you impacting systems? Like, h- how are you making a difference in that? So one, how can the rest of us make a difference too? Yeah. So I think uh, one thing that thing that I'll own that's kind of on the bigger level, but I'll I'll bring it down to more micro. Sure. But where everything starts usually, right? Ex- exactly. Uh, so. I'll, maybe, I'll, I'll do th- three things. I love threes, right? Me too. Um, so, we can be friends. <laughs> yeah. So on, on the big thing, something that I'm so grateful for, because sometimes, you know, you make a decision, but you don't always, like you make a decision, then you make it right. So that's a, a, a quote from my, my grandpa that he got from someone else, I'm sure too. Um, there's not necessarily the right decision, but you make a decision, you make it right. I, I made a jump with Numerica and something that I didn't know how flexible they would be on certain things. Cause like their, their system, we have to protect our members. We have to keep their m- money safe. Like even right now, that's so important. People need to feel that their money is safe. Absolutely. When you have, you know, multi-billion dollars of assets, you have, that's yeah. part of it. <laughs> so, uh, there's a lot of financial uncertainty right now for people. So we have to make sure that people feel safe and comfortable so that their lives can be what they can be. And, a big thing for me is like home ownership. That's the main place that people can store and create wealth. In our community, um, about 70 some percent of white families uh, own their own home. And it's low twenties for black families that have been here for big generations. Difference. And there's a lot of reasons for that. And it's not just, I mean, those are just two communities, but it kind of is, is representative. And so when you look at that, um, like how do you address it? Like the big, hairy, challenging goal uh, to address that. And the city was recognizing that with some of their ARPA funds, they wanted to be able to address it. And they put an RFP out for it's like, hey, can someone do a down payment assistance program? And I was able to very quickly work with our team to say, are we willing to put our hat in the ring? Can I we think, do this? This, this, is our, this is what we do. This isn't just charitable work. Like We've done some work with Habitat for Humanity and other things. That's charitable. We can write a grant, but we can't use the full force and, and knowledge and expertise of our organization to be able to serve this if we don't go in, in in other ways, in philanthropic ways. And so we went for this grant. We got it. We got $1.5 million that we're able to, we can do up to 20 to 25% down payment assistance. And we're targeting awesome. underserved communities, BIPOC communities, you know, single moms, people that are dealing with domestic violence, that people that otherwise, that the home ownership is out of reach for them. Yeah, it's not even, no. can't even be in their minds. And so we're working with them, we're actually working with someone, uh, another partner to do up to 30% down payment assistance, where 20% of that wow. or 25% of it could be just completely forgiven if you stay in that home for five years. And we could even, so we're trying to find all these different ways to, to layer it up. We want to, I want to like to move that needle in the communities that are underserved. So well, that, that is how it starts, right? It's like you saw an opportunity, you, you pull people together, start mm-hmm. moving and, and we can inspire folks and movement in these systems with just one person yeah. starts to work they tell their friends uh community builds and more people are like oh yeah i can do that too yep. well and yeah. I think just like the the one person the one conversation i would say we're exhausted like just as a community as a country as a world there's our compassion fatigue our um w- when you look at at all the isms Oftentimes it comes down to otherizing. But when we see that someone else is different than us, we, we have less compassion, we make more assumptions, and we're so wrong. And um, we are, aren't we? And, 
And while we've dismantled some of those, there's new of them, new ones that like I'm. I'm a pretty. I had a friend that um, I had a pretty conservative friend that that dubbed me a flaming moderate, and I'm like, oh, I embrace that man. Yeah. Like I'm a. I, I get that. Like, I, I, I get that my, my, my ballot is almost always split. I see things, I see good ideas on both sides of the, the and is it hard? Lots on brand for you, right? You're it is. Transitioning, being a part of all the communities. Like, and is it yeah. harder for me? Like, did I have a more diverse friend group in some ways than six years ago than I do now? Have ideological extremism made it harder to have compassion for certain people? Absolutely. And... If we're going to have a rich, vibrant community, we have to be able to have conversations with people that we don't think we agree with. And so there's some interesting local conversations. Uh, uh, Monica Guzman is coming back um, and with uh, uh, Aaron. Uh, oh, why am I blanking her last name? There's a conversation okay. happening here next week um, with two different authors with books. Of, I never thought of it that way. And all, there's different things like how do we have conversations across different divides? So when you talk about the one, one person, it's not just for systems to impact one person, but for us, who's someone that we can have a deeper conversation. Right. Who's someone that we have a disagreement with that we can build a relationship with or that we have an assumption about that we can have a deeper relationship. And another step, oftentimes, when we look at people that are, it's expensive to be broke. It's expensive yeah, to have bad credit. And I, I try not to say poor or whatnot because I think that's more of a, a state of mind. But broke, that's a balance sheet. And, and everyone know what that means. Exactly. Yep. And so, and it's like, there's different ways that when we have resources, when we have different experiences, there seems like there's more opportunities for someone that is broke, so for someone that doesn't necessarily have as many opportunities. Those relationships matter so much. And so relationships, knowledge, access, uh, if you've got a, you know, got friends, that you have, uh, their kids, you know, and, and they've got a friend, their family that's struggling, things, being able to, to, to have relationships even with the kids, just little things that it's not, you don't have to solve everything. But for kids, when they look at what's possible in their future, Oftentimes for, for lower wealth, lower income families, kids will often see only like five educational or f- five employment opportunities because they have a limited scope of opportunities. So their, their worldview starts to close yeah. in. Just finding relational ways to help people to be able to open up more thing that's possible. Because when you think of like talent, talent is equally distributed across people across the world. Opportunity is not. So we can't always do everything that we possibly want for, for adults. Like we've had our traumas. We have had our lived, lived experiences. So like we want to make people's lives better. And there's limitless opportunities that we can offer for kids often through just relationships. Yeah. You can inspire them to think about something else. So when you talk about like, what can we do? Yeah. I want to work on systems, but in the end there's, you know, the adage that, you know, uh, culture will eat strategy for breakfast. There's passionate people, there are our leaders, there are resourced people that can work on systems and opportunities. But if we have, if our culture gets more and more contentious and it's we're hard to launch big ideas, exactly that's really inclusive of a lot of people. So for I organizations, for communities, for neighborhoods, we need cultures that, that lead for opportunities that offer grace, that offer resilience. Um, do you have some advice around just our community around that? Like what can we do here in Spokane to just kind of fight that urge to, for, to be so divided? Yeah. So for me, a, a big thing is, is the conversations and a willingness to be wrong. Holy cow. Yeah. It's, it's, uh, it's I, I, powerful, right? When you can just raise your hand. It, it is. Well, and I think for me, like not only is that powerful within our own psyche, um, but it builds uh, intimacy uh, or vulnerability builds intimacy. Saying that I'm wrong or apologizing without um, qualification man, that can, that's vulnerability and that can build intimacy. And when we see this, like uh, Brene Brown, when you look at, the, at all of this uh, in, in leadership settings, leading with vulnerability or in relationships, uh, just a willingness to, to say I'm wrong and I'm sorry, uh, that really can matter. Oh, here's another thing. So we talk about the five love languages. Uh-huh. Uh, a lot of people- What's yours? Oh, I've got a lot of them. I think, <laughs> I think, I think we all have them. And here's the thing. The, all five of those love languages, I think people can understand or they can, they can, under, they can, have a, they can rationalize. I'm like, oh yeah, that makes sense. That may not be my primary thing, but I get it. The same team that, that identified those also looked at um, the five ways that people apologize. 
And so there's still a test. You can go online and, and, and check it out. But what I found is interesting there that people often do not recognize some of the other forms of apologies. I'm like, that's not even an apology. What are you talking about? And so, and so, so often we have in relationships or in communities, people are sorry or they are willing to defuse. But we're not hearing it. We don't recognize it since we uh. don't value it. And so we keep on being retrenched. And so something I, I would encourage people to check it out. And, and, and it's, it's a way to be curious um, and being able to even share like, hey, for me, this is how I make amends with people, uh, or this is what uh, it looks like for me. So anyway, those I've are things. I've learned to share with my, on that idea, it's like I've learned to share with my teams like how I apologize too, because I will hold, you know, my opinions very strong and, you know, I will, I will just keep putting it out there. Yep. But as new information comes in, I'll be quick to change my mind too and, yeah. and say, yeah, okay, you're right. Let's go. I'm wrong. Well, um, I- Something that I would follow up on that too is sometimes we own, so here's, so I, I developed the, this, the Center for Financial Stability that used a coaching model. What I love about coaching is you don't own someone else's outcome. And so oftentimes in relationships, why do we get stressed out? Well, he won't do this, like she won't do that. Like, right, but is that yours to own? Oh, no, it's not. But, but I, we've put ourselves in that situation or it's an employee advice. or whatever. And yeah. so something that I... What I've, I've realized is, and we just had a situation in, in America where a, a member had an experience where we think that we did, like, we had all the right intentions, and their experience of that wasn't the most positive. And they were willing to share that. Like, that's an incredible uh, feedback. And in some, as, as I was talking with some people, and they were asking me, like, well, how should we respond to this? I'm like, well, have we asked them? How would you have wanted us to show up differently in that situation? Because we couldn't think of anything better than what we did. And so sometimes like, well, we don't need to own the perfect response. No. And when you ask, ask, you might just get some magic out of that. Exactly. And so like that beautiful yeah. thing of we, it lowered our stress of having to own that we have to have the solution and it give, gave the space for someone else to be able to either offer their feedback or to recognize, you know what? I don't have the answer. Okay. We can be in that uncomfortable unknown together. There's more collaboration. Mm -hmm. I love your iterative process too. I just throughout our conversation, I keep hearing that, you know, I hear your grandpa's words. Mm -hmm. Um, Oh, there's so much power in that. Like you just don't have to be exactly right. You can just keep going, keep iterating. So this is something that that's not always who I used to be. And something that uh, I was just in a, uh, a leadership intensive that they talked about, like, we often approach the world uh, as a test that's pass fail, a battle that's won or lost, um, an adventure or a dance. And there's pros and cons in different ways in each of these things in different points in my life. I definitely used to think of things as like a test, like pass or fail. And I, I didn't have to be right, but I hated to be wrong. Kind of like the thing, like uh-huh. losing is not an option. I and, understand that feeling a little bit. Well, but, and I, there's always a way to win. There's always a way to uh, not just, uh, you know, polish uh, something um but to to say no like f- like we failed how did we learn that's a valuable when having a culture that and it, it, america is one of the best countries in many regards in part because we we allow failure and we allow redemption financially yep. and otherwise and that is not true in every culture in every country I've never thought about that. Yeah, we do love a good redemption it's, story. Well, and entrepreneurism yeah. is like mm-hmm. that we allow bankruptcy is like the way as easily as we do, honestly, that allows for resets and we, we factor it in into pricing and everything else like that. So something that was really powerful for me about a decade ago was I was leading, a, I was facilitating a conversation with very diverse stakeholders and I, I was trying to figure out how to make anything constructive. And I, where I shared myself is, hey, five years ago to now, if I tried... To, like five years ago, I would have been trying to get someone to agree with me, but I don't agree with myself five years ago to now. So why would I be arguing with myself? And so right now, why would I be get all bent out of shape if you don't agree with me on something? Because my future five-year self might not agree with myself. So why would I get all bent out of shape? And when I realized that, that my need for people to agree with me um, or that even I had the absolute answer, God, I held it way more loosely. Nice. And so for me, like, and I've been able to be more compassionate with myself and with others. And I think that's the biggest thing. Like if we cannot, we can't offer something to someone else sometimes that we don't offer for ourselves. if that's love. Um, and even sometimes for partnership, we can, we can offer a version of that to someone else, but we don't offer it for ourselves. 
Yeah, there's a. I think that's a core of happiness too. By the way, um, it's like yeah, when we can reflect some of those things back mm-hmm. into ourselves, like we do it well, happiness is, comes out of that. Yeah. Huh. You said you were in a leadership intensive. Uh, was this through Whitworth? It was. Yeah. All right. How how was that? By the way, the, your cohort. It's been it's been really good. Um, I got the nod. Uh, like last week, they're Congratulations. like, yeah, they're like Steve, we want you in. And <laughs> no. I was like, okay, yeah. So I, uh, yeah, I got in for this next year, and I'm really excited. It's why yeah. I can't. Any what? advice? <sighs> um, it's uh, well, we can't spill any of the tea, man. Oh like, well, yeah, see, no. it's uh, magic, everybody. If you don't know what we're talking about, you better <laughs> apply next year. Well, it's interesting. So actually, right before this interview, I was um, doing some thinking through. They asked us to do a a brief video to share people uh, with some of our experiences. And so there's a lot of different takeaways. But I think the most recent, strongest experience of that is we carpooled back from the last cohort, so that that conversation. And one of the most powerful parts of that weekend was that car ride. Nice. Because... Uh, getting to process with other people. Um, and again, it's it's uh, who we are. We are social beings. L- l- every part of life is a team sport. That food, we experience it differently with people. Lessons, leadership, faith, whatever it is, we experience it differently with people. And we cannot fully understand ourselves, who we are, how we lead any of these things without other people. And so if that's to uh, enjoy it, if that's to identify our blind spots, whatever it is, um, it's it's important. And so I think one of the biggest takeaways from that is uh, two adages that you'll probably hear early on. And it's not not, um, leadership on the line. Holy cow, that book early on. Oh, people, please read leadership on the line. Um, You heard it here. Oh, my gosh. Thanks, good gabbers. Pick it up now. (laughs) But the idea of leading, like leading self is it's it's amazing like i just keep on going further and further into it just so it, uh, something that if we, when we talk about leading ourselves so i i i broke up uh, i single for about a year and a half and in that time like i i that that partnership was so powerful to me i experienced more of my self in that partnership than ever before and i didn't want to give that up so the last year and a half has been a journey of partnering with myself this the start of the, the whitworth program was helping me look at wh- how do i lead not just others but myself in acts of leadership and i the, just the opportunity to reflect in that and like kind of pieces that I realized in the act of leadership. I'm like, we, we talk about that familiarity breeds contempt is kind of like an adage. And I started realizing like, who's the person that any of us spend the most time with? Yeah, right here. Huh? Ourselves. And so we often have, con- we don't treat that relationship with dignity and respect. And so for me, like what, it's it's I'm continuing in that journey so that how can I have compassion and I challenge him can I encourage myself and how do I lead myself um, and be intentional in that uh, and not just do it constantly because we have to have a breather and have a oh, break and absolutely. All that stuff. but yeah. just it's anyway so like that's been something that we are an iterative process too heck yeah, yeah. <laughs> so lots of different things I could take away from that but I think part of it too is the people both the 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 people the servant leaders that they bring in to instruct uh, as well as the people uh, and, and walking that journey with them uh, has been absolutely beautiful uh, and I keep on uh, and, and anyway I'm excited even why, why am I willing to have this type of conversation uh, because I want to have conversations if it's, if it's, you know, virtually and if it's it kind of a, a it's, we're skipping across things or if it's deeper in that like, this is, this is what, this is what I'm built for. I want these connections. I want to be the best I possibly, like collaborative co- competition, right? Like I want to be the absolute best I possibly can yes. be. And I want you to be as well. Let's do this. I know. And then we're going to move the needle and our, our communities are stronger because of it. Absolutely. Oh. Lars, I wish we had more time. I, I just can't wait to uh, keep uh, following you. I know our uh, listeners, you know, get to see y- you work your magic all throughout the community. I'm just curious. Any parting thoughts for for us today? I would just remind us, like some of our best memories are the little things, um, and so just 
I don't know why this comes to mind right now, but I look outside. So we've got this absolutely beautiful weekend coming up, Memorial Day. So just like if Memorial Day that we're remembering things. I just lost my grandma. And Sorry. She was one of the closest people to me. And it's so many of the... I can think of all these little things. And so I think both for ourselves, let's enjoy the little moments, if it's in relationships, if it's in leadership, whatever. And as, as we have this summer, if it's, you know, we're, everybody, you know, runs to a lake at some point in time or whatever <laughs> right. it is. That's the Spokane way. Right. So if it's, if it's a, if you're on the lake, if you're driving with someone, whatever, like, where can we take some little moments? We don't have to be perfect. We don't have to change the world. But in, today, when you're listening to this, when you're watching this, or when you think of this, where you t- tell somebody else about this, make a little moment, make something that matters because man, like you talk about iterative, Let's go make some of those little moments that matter. And that's going to maybe be the moment for someone that changes something. Maybe that's the moment that is a touchstone for you. So it's not about making something big sometimes. Let's make some great little moments that make a difference. Well said. I will think about that. I'm going to make some little moments this weekend. Lars, thanks for joining us. Thank you. 